We're carrying on our series and we're wrestling with the topic of loneliness this week. I've started putting arrows to the corresponding emojis that match these emotions here. I've thought about wearing even like t-shirts that match the emotion somehow, so I guess I'm feeling blue this week as we talk about loneliness. Maybe I should wear red, like flaming red for next week's anger session, I don't know, but uh, who knows. But so, I've got a couple thoughts about loneliness and what God says about loneliness, what his word says about loneliness. So, the first thought that I have about loneliness is this. It is not good. If there's anything we've learned during the course of this quarantine, which, by the way, is celebrating its year anniversary here in a couple weeks. It's been one year since we went on lockdown back in March. We've learned that loneliness is not a good thing. God did not design us to be alone, but he designed us to be in community, as he himself is in community by nature. He's Trinitarian by nature, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He has fellowship in and of himself by his very nature. And we are made in his image. And that's why we yearn for community. That's why when we are separated from people for long periods and seasons of times, we start to feel like something's off because something is off. We are not fulfilling our calling as human beings. God says this in Genesis chapter one, after he creates the world, he says, he saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and morning the sixth day, his last day of creation before he rested on the seventh day. He sees everything that he creates and it is very good. Not just good, but very good. Why? Because he created man on that day. We are the zenith, the pinnacle of creation, made in his image. That's why that day was very good. But then God says something very intriguing merely one chapter later in Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, Adam, whom was his only creation in, made in the image of God form during that time. Is God speaking with a forked tongue here? Is he doubling back on his word, saying some things are very good and then other things aren't? No, he's not saying that. The created order is really good. Everything he made was really good. But relationally, there was something that was off. Because we are communal by nature and we need community. Now, this is not saying that, for example, if God calls you to a lifelong commitment to singleness and you're unmarried for the entirety of your life, that you should condemn yourself. God calls people to do things like that. He gives everybody a gift, some a gift of singleness and some a gift of marriage, and I don't know what he's going to call you to in your life. But even in your singleness, you should still be surrounded by godly people who are pushing you closer and closer to Christ. Jesus was single. The apostle Paul was single for the entirety of his life. But yet they were surrounded, of course, by godly people, Jesus being God himself, that pushed them on in their faith. And that's what we must surround ourselves with, people like that. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whatever your station in life is, the command remains the same. Be around people who push you in your faith. When I went down to Odessa, Texas, I might not have known quite what I was getting into. I moved into an apartment all by myself, 1,800 miles away from home, didn't know anybody down there, and I remember my dad leaving me for my first night after getting there, and I'm thinking, what did I get into? <laughs> and I remember the day before I left for Texas when I FaceTimed one of my buddies from college, and he shared with me a quote from a movie. I think it's from Into the Wild. He said, Marcus, next slide, please. Happiness is nothing if it can't be shared. Happiness is nothing if it can't be shared. From my buddy Joe Newsbaum. I took that screenshot of us having that conversation. Oddly enough, our carpet looks exactly the same. Happiness is nothing if it can't be shared. If you can't share your happiness and your joy in community, then it's almost cut in half. Happiness was designed to be multiplied through sharing it in community. It is not good for us to be alone. Second thing I'd like to say about loneliness Though it is not good to ultimately be alone and to be removed from community forever, 
I will say this. Though it's not good for man to be alone, it is for certain seasons. It can be good. It can be good. It can be used for good. Now, how do I know this? We see this even in Jesus' life in Luke chapter 4. Do we not? It says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit after he'd just been baptized. The inception of his earthly ministry. He's just been baptized. It says that he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's not absent from the Holy Spirit. He's not rebelling against the Holy Spirit through what he's about to do here. It says that he's full of the Holy Spirit and he left the Jordan and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This same word that's translated led in this verse, in its original language, this verse is also translated elsewhere as drug or carried. Jesus, in a sense, was so empowered by the Holy Spirit that it's as if he was being drugged into the wilderness, into the desert by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not resisting God's call on his life, his Father's call on his life, the Holy Spirit's call in his life. It was because he was full of the Holy Spirit that he actually entered into a difficult season because God called him there and he was obedient. Jesus was not drug kicking and screaming against his will to be led into the wilderness. He willingly wanted to go. But that empowerment was so strong that if he were to go against the Spirit's leading, he would have been sinning. He would have been disobeying. And oftentimes, God will call you into seasons where you feel like you're being a desert. You feel like God is leading you to an extended time of prayer or fasting or Bible study or whatever it is. That is a normal part of the Christian life. We see that right here. If you're filled with the Spirit, you will make time to be much alone with God in prayer and in study, as we'll see here in a moment. So he's tested there for 40 days, tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and no kidding, at the end of them, he was hungry. He was hungry. Now, sometimes when we think of wilderness, we think of like sub-Saharan Africa, lush wilderness, trees, water, all sorts of exotic animals. That's kind of what maybe we think of here when we think of wilderness. But that's not how the Bible pictures the wilderness for us. It's not how it uses the word. In fact, the wilderness kind of looks something like this in Judea, where Jesus Christ would have been tempted for 40 days. This is the definition of nothing. There's nothing out here. The only animals that reside here are snakes, scorpions, jackals, and other wild animals that you don't want to mess with. And Jesus was led here, if not drug here in accordance with his will, to be tested by the devil because he was so full of the Holy Spirit. Here's another picture of what the Judean desert looks like. It's like 150 degrees. There's no shade there's nowhere to take cover. And Jesus willingly decided to go out here to prepare himself for his ministry, to pass the test, to prove Satan wrong. And Jesus did not just do this on the 40 days that he was fasting. In fact, he made an intentional effort every single day to go out to desolate places and pray. It says this in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5 says that the news was spreading about him all the more as he healed people, as he ministered to people, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places, desert places, desolate places, like the last two pictures that you just saw, so that he could be much alone with God in prayer. This should be your daily habit as a Christian, being much alone with God. Whether you got to do it as soon as you wake up or right before you go to bed or making some time in the middle of the day, whatever your best time is to devote the most energy to God and his word that you can, you must be doing so if you want to have any hope in growing as a Christian. The third thing I want to say about loneliness is this. God has gone, back one slide please, sorry. God has gone out of his way to give you company, out of his way to make sure that you feel like you have companionship. 
not just in the form of friends, he does that for sure, but he also gives you a capital F, friend. A capital C, comforter. He gives you himself. He gives you his Holy Spirit to dwell within you so that you can never feel ultimately alone. He didn't have to do that. He could just be residing in heaven, governing everything for us and not actively intervening in our hearts. But he has ensured that you will feel comfort. He has ensured that you will feel his presence on a day in, day out basis. And he does this by sending us his Holy Spirit. And Travis, you're gonna love this one. I actually went to the KJV for this next translation. I went KVG on him. I went KVG on him. Because I like the translation here. Let's go next slide, please. In John chapter 14, it says this. Jesus is praying. He says, I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Some translations say helper or advocate or whatever it is. But I like this idea as well, the comforter. Not something that you put on your bed, but something that goes in your heart. Someone that goes in your heart who's working actively every single day to make sure that you feel his comfort. She'll give you another comforter. Why does Christ say another comforter? Who is the first comforter? Jesus was the first comforter. But I'm going to send you another one. And it's going to be my spirit. And he's going to dwell within you. And he's going to comfort you day in, day out. That he may abide with you forever. He's not taking this from you. The spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. This sounds like KJV to the core. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. Another translation says, I will not leave you as orphans. He will come to you, and he will actively abide in you to make sure that you feel his presence every single day. Next slide, please. Billy Graham says this about loneliness in ministry, which can be a very lonely place. He says, I've spent many a day alone, but I've never had a lonely day because of Jesus Christ in me. Next slide, please. Got to get cooking here a little bit. God will never remove his company, regardless of the circumstance that you're going in, going through. Never. He's given you his word in that verse we just saw, right? It will abide with you forever to my Sandlot fans out there. He's never taken it. Regardless of circumstance, he ain't taken it. There's an interesting verse here in the book of Hebrews. It says this, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In other words, dear friends, even if your earthly resources forsake you, I never will. Trust me. The promise is not uh, be content with what you have and stay free from the love of money because you'll always have enough money. The promise doesn't say that. The promise is I will be with you and I will give you everything that you need down to the nickel if that's what it requires. Next slide, please. But I will say this. In light of the fact that he will never remove his comforter from you, I do have to make this comment. But disobedience to God Dear friends, disobeying God's clear word as revealed in scripture, it can contribute to your feelings of loneliness. It can. One of the reasons many of us feel lonely right now is because we are actively running from God, the one source of our comfort, the one whose presence can only ultimately provide us with satisfaction and joy, and it's because we're running from him. You might be a Christian but you're not experiencing the active presence of God and work of God in your life because you've quenched his spirit. Disobedience will do that to a person. Jesus says this in John chapter eight. He says, the one who sent me is with me. God the Father is with God the Son. He has not left me alone. Why? For I always do what pleases him. The reason that Jesus felt so close in his human nature to his heavenly father is because he obeyed him day in and day out. 
If you do what pleases your earthly parents day in and day out, you will feel a close-knit bond to them that you would not experience if you were disobeying them day in and day out. If you want to experience closeness to your heavenly Father, obey him. Delight in his law. Seek to please him. Nobody was closer to his Father than Jesus was. And I pray that we can experience even some of that closeness as we obey him as well. Skip the next two slides, please. Or the next slide, I should say. Another thing I'd like to say is this. I got seven of these, by the way. I don't want to scare you up front, so I'll buzz through these last two. But one of the reasons that we often feel lonely, I think, is because we're living for the praise and the approval and the acceptance of the world. That's why we feel lonely. Because living for the approval of the world, dear friends, is a very lonely venture. As soon as you have your 15 minutes of fame, that will dissipate, and they'll forget about you. Even if your 15 minutes last your entire life, you will die, and the world will move on to somebody else and you'll be left just as lonely as you were before, if not more so. The praise of man never satisfies. It wasn't designed to. Our praise was designed to come from God and be received as a gift from God. Romans chapter two says this, that the Christians, us here, the Christians praise is not from other people or from God. That's whose approval we live for. That's who we want clapping for us, if you will. It's God. And it broke my heart this past weekend when we were at the retreat, when we were doing the affirmation booklets. I was talking to a student, and they're kind of bummed because they didn't get as many affirmations as last year. They tallied them up. I don't know how they did this. But they remembered that they received so many affirmations last year, and that was just a little less than they received this year. And this verse immediately popped into mind. Our praise, our affirmation, our glory does not reside in man. It comes from God. That's his approval we live for. So if you feel like nobody is noticing you, nobody's accepting you, nobody's clapping for you and your cause here on earth, know that God is. Know that God is. And finally, number seven. While on the cross, beloved, Christ was the loneliest person to ever live. Do you feel lonely tonight? Have you felt lonely at some point during the past year? Please know that Christ experienced it first. Until its fullest extent, he experienced loneliness. No one was more righteous than Christ, and no one was more utterly forsaken than Christ, the very Son of God. Jesus says this when he's on the cross. Back up one slide, please. In Matthew chapter 27, he says, it says, at about the ninth hour, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, in other words, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. How he summoned the energy to be able to do that while he was suffocating is amazing in and of itself. But that's beside the point. He cried out in a loud voice saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? forgotten me, abandoned me, made me feel utterly hopeless and lonely. Very strange statement from the lips of Christ. Because as we just saw, Jesus always felt the pleasure of his Father. He never felt alone because he always did what pleased his Father. And then he says this, why have you forsaken me? A phrase like this will take an eternity to meditate on. What did Christ mean by this? And this statement by Jesus Christ just goes to show how forsaken and forgotten Christ really felt. We cannot underestimate how much wrath and condemnation and judgment Jesus Christ received on the cross for our sins when he bore the sins of all the world. We can't underestimate it. There's a sense in which Jesus Christ was the greatest sinner who ever lived because all the world's sins were poured on him, 
the cross. And what I'm about to say might be one of the most anti-biblical things I probably will ever say, but I think you'll know what I mean by this. Christ was so forsaken while he was on that cross that it's almost as if the very Trinity itself was broken. Now we all know that the Trinity can't be broken because God would therefore stop being God. He doesn't know anything but being himself. Nothing can break him. Nothing can separate him. But this goes to show just how profoundly Jesus Christ was bearing all of our sins. And how, in a very real sense, the Father did completely turn his face away from his very own Son. Nobody has ever felt more forsaken than Jesus Christ. And that should be an encouragement to us, dear friends. If we feel forsaken, Christ felt utterly forsaken first. So in conclusion here, loneliness, it's not good. But for certain seasons, it can be, if you use it well. You could waste your season of loneliness too, by the way. Let's not do that. God has gone out of his way to give you company. God will never remove his company, regardless of circumstance. But disobedience to God, it can contribute to your feelings of loneliness. You want to feel close to God? Obey him. Cling to him in faith every single day. Your praise comes from God, and on the cross, Christ was the loneliest person to ever live. But we know, even in that moment, do you remember what Christ said one verse later? He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He knew that his father had not ultimately forgotten him. And in the midst of your loneliness, as you cry out to God and feel like Jesus did, know that you can commit your life to God, just like Christ did. We walk by faith, dear friends, and not by feelings. Trust God, even in the midst of your loneliness, and may God give us the grace to do so. Let's pray. Jesus, you died for lonely people, like me and everyone else in this room. We all go through this. Thank you that the loneliness that we experience, you did it first. And yet you still trusted your Father. Give us that same measure of trust, even an inkling of it, please, God. May we know that you have not left us or forsaken us ultimately. We can trust you. Your spirit is in us. May we listen to him. May we be led by him. May we flee to community. Christian community, people who care about the genuine well-being of our souls. Help us to flee to people like that. But may we ultimately flee to you every single day, even if we have to go to a desolate place to do it. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.